PayPal recently open sourced the key value database named JunoDB and I spent a few days going through it to understand its features and guarantees. In a series of videos, I will be going through the database and talking about the key details and design decisions they took while building this. In the process, we will understand the internals of JunoDB and how a production grade key value store is built. This is the first video of the series and in this one, I will be giving you an overview of the database how it differs from Redis and at the end we will talk about an interesting problem called latency bridging and how JunoDB solves it for paper. So becoming a better engineer is the need of the hour and to help you all reach the next level I have something that you will find amusing. I conduct super practical courses with a no-nonsense approach. These courses are designed to help you become a better engineer and ace your career. The courses will definitely reignite your love for engineering and spark the much needed engineering curiosity. Some of my most popular courses are on system design and database internals. Because I operate with a no-fluff approach, my courses are enrolled by folks across all levels from SD1s to tech leads to staff to EMs to VP engineering of some of the most prominent companies out there. All the details about the courses like curriculum, prerequisites, testimonials, FAQs can be found on the course pages and I have linked them in the description down below. So do check them out and I cannot wait to see you all become better engineers and ace your engineering career. Now let's go back to the video. So JunoDB is a distributed key value store which is designed, built and open source by PayPal. The best part of it being open source is that you can find the entire source code at github.com slash paypal slash JunoDB. It's written entirely in Golang, highly recommend you to go through that. JunoDB powers some of the key services at PayPal. It does not mean it's a source of truth for them. It is used in some of the core services, core backend services at PayPal, like authentication, login, risk management, and transaction processing. The key motive through which this JunoDB was built is that they wanted a very efficient way to store and cache the data. The best part being that JunoDB is not entirely in memory, but it can still cache data for you it has persistent storage as well. That's the highlight of this, right? The key impact that JunoDB has brought in for PayPal is that it reduces the load on relational database. You know, most payments platform use relational databases primarily because of its asset guarantees and because that being the source of truth for most payments platform out there, we know how, how expensive SQL queries can get when you are joining large number of tables or when you are running a complex aggregation. So by using a cache, it's a very common way. By using a cache, you are reducing the load on relational database. For example, if you've already computed an expensive query, why would you want to recompute it by firing them on relational database again? So the responses are typically cached on JunoDB. This makes the load on this database go down and it just ensures that your system is more available than not. Another thing that you see is that JunoDB reduces the load on the downstream services. So obviously in a microservices based architecture, one service depends on another service. Now for example, this microservice one, let's say it depends on microservice two. Now what would happen is whenever this service needs any information that is owned by this another microservice, it would make a call to this microservice, right? Now, by making redundant, by making a large number of calls to this service, this service has a risk of going down. But if there is a near static response that can be cached, JunoDB is being used there to cache that stuff. It caches the response coming from another microservices if required. Now, what does this mean? Although obviously if you think of it, this another microservice can also have its own cache and where it is caching it. But the point is, why is this first microservice even making a call to the second microservice if this first microservice can itself cache some of the responses from the second microservice? So JunoDB, it's a, it can be used to replace your legacy, your legacy caching system where you are caching responses, output of queries from relational databases, responses from another microservices that you depend on. So it is a drop in replacement for your legacy caching services. There is nothing very fancy about it, right? Okay, now let's talk about the language of implementation. This is where we'll talk about how it differs from Redis. So JunoDB started as a single threaded C++ program. 
like redis redis is a single threaded c program uh, juno db is a sing was started as a single threaded c++ program but paypal rewrote it in golang now this is an interesting choice we know c++ is known for, for performance c++ supports multi threading but still paypal started with single thread c++ program mostly getting inspired by redis but then they rewrote it in golang now the two factors that they mentioned that why did they do it is first they wanted to leverage the high concurrency that golang provides using go routines we know how go routines are lightweight threads they are basically fibers but you know how efficient they are you know how many of them you can create to get things done parallelly right they are far more efficient than traditional posix threads which then multiplex over kernel thread so because of cheap or rather right because of efficient multi threading or uh, sorry because of efficient concurrency that golang offers they chose to write it in rewrite it in golang second is because single threaded this because if your program is single threaded no matter how many cores you have in your underlying hardware your single threaded program will always execute on one thread or on one cpu core of your hardware so no matter if you have four cores or 32 cores it will only use just one core to get things done now this is a feature for redis but for zero db it did not suit their use case now this what this tells us that when you run redis even if you are running redis on a 32 core machine out of those 32 core 31 cores are not even being used right but this is not a problem for redis because redis load is memory bound and not cpu bound and this tells us that juno db is well suited for cpu bound loads right so the kind of features that juno db offers require them higher amount of cpu than redis than a uh, redis like load right so which is where you see you can easily deduce from this design decision that because they wanted it to be multi core friendly it implies that the kind of features that juno db would offer would require them to leverage multiple cpus right and which is exactly why if you have a if you have a high cpu requirement if you have a high cpu intensive operations you typically would not go for redis in that case because if it is cpu intensive one core will not be able to suffice right if you have 31 core if you have 32 cores why not just use them all and parallelize it right so these are the things that just one statement mentioned over there that they wanted it to be multi core friendly helps us did you so many details about it right okay now let's jump into the availability part of it few numbers that they mentioned on the repo juno db provides six nines of availability for paypal that's insane that's insanely high six nines of availability implies 31.56 seconds of downtime every year and that's pretty sharp and it handles 350 billion request every day for them pretty huge load so let's go through the common use case and understand them this is where we'll talk about latency bridging the first common use case that juno db solves for paypal is obviously caching right it because it can store data in memory and on disk for the in memory part you can use it as a temporary cache so where you can have ptl configured from interestingly few seconds to few days this tells us something really interesting few seconds it's like very temporary storage that you are trying to use maybe your odd token odd token might not be exact maybe your otp passwords and all and few days implies that the whatever you have stored should sustain in the database for few days which means there has to be an on disk persistence for this database right simple lines help us did you so many things about any any tool framework database that we are going through okay few use cases they use it for cash user tokens which makes sense like these are authentication tokens like why would you want to go to your primary auth database to see if the token is valid why can't you just leverage cash for it a classic caching use case second is account details account details do not update very frequently so you can very well store the details like store you can very well cache the account details in your cache so that you reduce the amount of queries that you are firing on your source of truth then caching the api response we know how microservice one was dependent on microservice two to get thing to get some response 
what if you catch the actual like, api response over that so that you don't even have to go to that other service and user preferences for example user preferences like hey me as a user i'm saying i don't want to say i don't want to receive android notification i don't want to receive any uh, mobile notification for transactions happening on paypal this preference very infrequently updates so you can actually catch these preferences and use it while you are sending out the notification right so anything that is near static a very classic legacy caching use case you can use juno db for that or the paypal uses juno db for that right now the second one second common use case that paypal solves it is item potency now item potency is all about avoiding duplicate processing which means that no matter how many times that operation comes to you if that operation is executed once no matter how many times it comes you would not be reprocessing the data or ne reprocessing the request we know re retries are painful retries are essential but they are painful because what if you wanted to transfer money from one account to another account the money got transferred but the state did not get updated due to some reason and another request came in because your request your acknowledgement dropped in between now because of the retry this request got reprocessed again but what you don't want the amount should not be transferred again so this is item potency that no matter how many times it comes in you will be processing it exactly once so paypal uses juno db to power this and you know like the way to implement it is item potency key there are a bunch of videos on my channel if you may want to watch them how to implement item potency right but item potency is really critical for especially for uh, financial platforms like paypal and juno db solves it from them storing the item potency keys of the transactions that are initiating ensuring that there is no reprocessing of payment there is no resending of notification so which means before sending or before doing any action you check for the item potency key if that is done or not if that is done then you just drop the retried request that comes in right okay now the final problem the final use case that it solves it's pretty interesting so hear me out juno db solves latency bridging latency bridging for that sounds fancy but it's really easy to understand so juno db has really fast so the key feature that juno db has it has really fast inter cluster replication so if you have two clusters of juno db you can configure a replication between them and this would be near instant which means a very low replication lag between these two clusters so any update coming on any of the cluster gets in near instant transferred to or a near instant replicated to another cluster this is a super important feature why because now that given that the replication latency between two juno db clusters is really less if my write goes at one place and my read goes to another i would see almost consistent data now how does this help paypal uses oracle as its primary data. we saw how it uses relational databases right so paypal uses oracle as its primary databases and they have to maintain very high availability they use oracle in active active mode so you have two data centers in which you have two database clusters two oracle database clusters running and their replication is set up between them this replication because of they being relational databases and the kind of load that it handles it's slow as like it's not as fast as paypal would have liked it it's not near instant if they move it to synchronous it would take down the it would reduce the write throughput for paypal so what they are doing is they are relying on this slow replication slow but reliable replication from oracle to get things done right so any so writes can go to anywhere and reads can go to anywhere it's active active mode so let's say the request from this client went to this oracle the write request but the read request went to another data center why because let's say due to some reason this data center got cut off so for high availability systems this request went to another data another data center so now what would happen that if this data is not yet replicated over here then you would see this write failing you would see that data not found right because these are not consistent because if you do it synchronously it would lower down your write throughput you cannot just do that right so replication lag between these two oracle is a pain point so what they use is they use juno db 
in conjunction to oracle so the idea being that you have in each of your data center you have your oracle databases running plus you have your juno db clusters running with a near instant replication between them so now when you are sending the writes you write to the oracle database and to the juno db and when you are reading because the replication is near instant you can read from juno db right obviously some use cases may not be transparent i don't know the internals but you see how beautifully near instant near instant replication across clusters can help you bridge the latency gap so this high level pattern you can use it to solve read your writes problem in almost any distributed system so long as it supports near instant replication and juno db does support this so this was one of the key features that paypal wanted like the way they built it is because they wanted to address this problem of slow replication with this because now no matter if your read go to another data center because this the juno db instance in another data center gets near instant update from the one from the first one you can still see the you can still read the write that you wrote in another data center in a near instant right this is latency bridging and this is very well addressed by juno db and obviously think of implementation you would have to still write a bunch of code to do it so transparent right but that's fine but you see this how how beautifully you can solve latency bridging with having a near instant replication between your quote unquote caching layer right and yeah this is what i wanted to cover in this one this is a very high level overview of juno db right this was the first video in this multi part series where i'm diving deep into juno db right i hope you really found it interesting latency bridging was a really interesting problem that juno db solved you can pick this high level pattern and apply it at n number of systems out there so yeah this is what i wanted to cover as part of the overview of juno db it's a very high level over overview of juno db this was the first video in the series where i diving deep into juno db in the next one we'll be talking about the architecture of juno db and the key design decisions they made it there what makes it really special right so yeah i hope you found it interesting hope you found it amusing that's it for this one i'll see you in the next one thanks a lot